Hi, I'm Arwa Shobaki, Managing Director of the Project on Middle East Democracy for POMED. Welcome to the sixth episode of Between the Lines, POMED's author interview series. I'm very pleased today to be here with Dr. Jillian Schwedler to discuss her new book, Protesting Jordan, Geographies of Power and Dissent, published by Stanford University Press. Jillian is a professor of political science at the City University of New York's Hunter College and the Graduate Center. And she is definitely a Jordanian expert and someone I'm very happy to be speaking with today. Welcome Jillian and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much Arwa. In your book, Protesting Jordan, you thoughtfully explore the history of protest in Jordan and demonstrate that since Jordan's founding, there have been and continue to be hundreds of protests each year across the country. You describe that in Jordan, protests rather than just challenging the political authority, also work to structure the political terrain on which authorities seek to produce their power. You describe protests as very much a part of the social fabric used by both the citizens and the regime at times for citizens to demonstrate against the government and at other times as a way for the regime to reinforce its narrative and promote nationalism. Just in the past 10 years, there have been protests against cuts to subsidies on basic goods, against neoliberalism and privatization, against taxation, against corruption, and against high levels of unemployment. These protests are normally directed at the prime minister and the government, and not the king and the royal family. But even this has changed in more recent years. With increased pressure and crackdowns in Jordan on free expression and association, including prison sentences for digital protests via social media and messaging apps, the future of protests feels somewhat less secure in Jordan these days and somewhat less tolerated by the regime. How citizens innovate to demand their rights and protests against bad government policies feels particularly important these days, but also increasingly under threat. For this reason, your book is both historically informative, but also incredibly timely for those of us closely following and hoping for a less restrictive Jordan and a more responsive regime to its citizens' demands. To start our conversation today, I'd like to begin with asking you, in your analysis, you differentiate between government-sanctioned protest and unwelcome protest that is met with a violent response by the government. You also discuss the changing demographic of those that protest, specifically the increase of rural East Bankers taking to the streets. Yet the Western world hears very little about protests in Jordan. Therefore, I think it'd be interesting to start by asking you to explain to our audience, how do you define protest and what are its different forms in Jordan? Thank you. And thank you for that great introduction and summary of some of the, the core themes in the book. So the analysis starts in the Ottoman period in the mid 19th century and goes up through the coronavirus pandemic to the present. And so the definition of protest that I'm using is really a broad, expansive uh, framework of simply people gathering public to press claims against typically those in power, although sometimes they could be against corporations or other entities, foreign embassies. So it's a kind of public claims making where you're gathering in public to assert a political demand. This allows the analysis to encompass a wide range of things from uh, blocking roads with burning tires, uh, burning down police stations, to peaceful sit-ins and uh, stationary protests that are more familiar of the contemporary moment when we talk about protests in that sense. So I'm trying to capture that sweeping arc of these activities. And one of the things I see is some of the early activities such as blocking roads and burning, burning down police stations that existed in the Ottoman period continue up until today as well as more modern forms of protest, gathering with placards in public squares and peacefully marching also have emerged to take place across Jordan. Great. And in, in your um, analysis, what have you found to be protected speech and what are the types of protests that are allowed by the government? So polit political expression is permitted uh, under the, the law with the broad exception of uh, criticizing the king which is illegal under several laws. And so you'll often find people criticizing the prime minister or the government when they mean the regime. Now, like in places like the United States, the freedom of speech that's enshrined is different from your right to conduct that speech in various places. And so in Jordan, it's not simply what you, what you can say, can you criticize the king or not? And we'll come back to that in a minute, the criticism of the king, but where you can say it. And that's one of the innovations of the analysis is 
to move beyond who's saying what and what kinds of protest activities, but also where they're saying it. And so in certain places, you can say things all you want, but they're not particularly disruptive. In other places, the same claims will be met by you know, uh, violent police repression or simply trying to prevent the protest from existing or gathering at all. That's fascinating. So where does the government draw the so-called red line? Well, the red line for one hand, as I said, is to do with criticism of the king. And that's a pretty consistent one, although people do violate it over the past decade increasingly at protests and chant against the king and mock the king. Uh, but really there's another way to think about the red line and that is whether you're doing kinds of protests that are familiar that the government is used to and can feel reasonably compliment, uh, confident in terms of how it'll turn out versus innovations or new places where people haven't protested before where it feels very provocative and the police are unsure. So to give an example, which I think is uh, surprising in some ways, is you'll have protests in the downtown area that can be thousands of people that will gather in front of the Grand Husseini Mosque and they'll march a kilometer to the municipal center and they'll rally there for an hour and they'll disperse. Those protests are not threatening to the regime at all. They pretty much don't care and don't interfere as long as you adhere to that routine and also that you leave after a few hours. Smaller groups, even in out of the way places that don't seem very visible, but also in, in the capital Amman in certain places, if you try to set up a tent and stay there for overnight or several days or a week or more, that is considered particularly contentious. So as long as you hear, adhere to many of the familiar routines and you disperse after a number of hours without any violence, for the most part, with some exceptions, for the most part, that's acceptable. It's these sort of deviations, particularly putting up tents uh, blocking prominent uh, commercial thoroughfares, things like this will be met with a harsher repression, even if it's only a dozen or a handful of people, as opposed to thousands downtown. So the surprise there is that thousands in the city center can be less contentious than two dozen in an outlying village. Because presumably the thousands in the city center are protesting in a way and in a place um, that they have done for tens of years. and it's somehow controllable and understood, um, but yeah, by the government. Yeah. And it's familiar and often it's done by people like the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic Action Front who are trying to protect their relationship with the regime. So they're very careful to protect property. The Muslim Brotherhood in particular has its own parade guards. They wanna make sure their people don't get out of control. And so they're very well behaved protests. So they look provocative when you see photographs of them or in data sets, like thousands turned out, the Islamists had this major turnout. But when you're down there, nobody minds, you go strolling by, people stop and take photos and move on to a cafe. Nobody's concerned of any kinds of violence. Uh, and yet other, other, and also they're known as well. Other times new groups will emerge, they're not known activists or they're different sets that haven't gathered together and they're in different places, different slogans, different routines the government's just unsure. And so they're much more nervous about that. There's a really funny example in the, about the anti-gas deal with Israel protests, that they're in a uh, massive field and they want to unfold a banner that has the slogan for the campaign. So you could see it from the high rises looking down on it. And the riot police, the gendarmerie, the Derek, are really trying to prevent them from doing this because they think it's a tent. And they don't want them to set up a tented encampment and so finally, when they convince it's, them it's a banner, they're, they don't mind at all. So it's, again, it's a small protest, but no tents. Tents are now one of the red lines. That's fascinating. And I was just about to ask you about the red lines and like how much you've seen them change since the Arab Spring. Um, and, and I'm wondering if this tent issue is one of those because we did see as in Egypt, in Bahrain, in numerous countries that were a part of the you know, 2011 Arab uprisings, um, tents and, and sit-ins for weeks and weeks on end were um, really some of the ways that citizens got what they asked for. Um, so I that, yeah, I think that's spot on. The sort of the tented encampment are we're making demands and we're not gonna leave until they're met. Some of the other protests are, we're gonna make our demands, but we're gonna leave in three, four hours. So there's no concern. Jordan did have a tented encampment that emerged the March 24th youth. It also emerged in a new location where no one had protested before. Um, the circle near the Ministry of the Interior, which was also because of the symbolism of 
of Tunisia and Egypt targeting those ministries became very symbolic in Jordan. Um, it was dispersed uh, the next day, beginning in the middle of the night, but it was violently dispersed the next day by a combination of loyalists as well as government, um, various government policing forces. Protests typically have four or five different policing agencies present. Uh, but the videos that have uploaded to YouTube show very clear coordination between the so-called loyalists, the Beltagia, and the government officials. You can see them talking to each other and pointing to go here and there. So it's very clear that it's coordinated, even though it gives the government an excuse. And this was the first death in the two years of the uprisings um, till the end of uh, 2012, when it pretty much stopped in Jordan. This was the first of seven or eight deaths to take place over that period, uh, because this was not permitted. An encampment was too um, contentious. It was too threatening. So you did see the tents emerged in this period. There were tents at protests previously that weren't as contentious. So tents emerge as a red line. Uh, the interior circle emerges as a place where um, the government doesn't want protests to emerge. And I write about in the book a number of the places where the government doesn't want there to be protest. They begin to wall off spaces, put up fences, landscape, basically remove these public squares from being accessible to the public because in fact they don't want the public to protest there. I even document there's this large mega project called the Abdali Boulevard in Amman, so Jordan's new downtown with skyscrapers, where the, uh, the model rendering of the, the project includes above Abdali Mall, which is an underground mall, a huge plaza. And it's, it's on the 3D model and it doesn't exist in practice because they were concerned it would become a space for protest. So you can see it even affects how they're building public space because they're so concerned about protesters. So that's another way in which that's changed. And a third, which I think you probably will ask me about later, but since I'm on the, the changes since the uprisings, is the escalation in direct criticism of the king himself. Um, it's typically a red line and it's illegal under several laws. Um, during the uprising period, uh, someone burned a photo of the king and found himself arrested, but then his tribe rallied around him and he got released after a short period. But increasingly, people would criticize the king, first in veiled ways, and then increasingly directly. Uh, in the fall of 2012, there was an interesting moment when there were some anti-austerity protests where um, uh, they were criticizing uh, Abdullah, but the prime minister's first name was Abdullah as well. And so it had a little bit of ambiguity whether you were talking about the king or not. But then in a few, you know, a day later, you hear Abdullah and Rania, there's no ambiguity there. And so since this period, you've seen, and this is one of the, the innovations that I document that not a lot of people have paid a specific attention to, is the rhetoric in protests of directly criticizing the king and criticizing the queen. Uh, at protests and mocking them and saying, you've done nothing for us and you're corrupt uh, directly. And people do get arrested for it. And some people are forced to leave the country, but others rally protests around those who are arrested and then they get released. And there's sort of this game of back and forth that the regime is trying desperately to silence this rhetoric, this criticism, shut down certain spaces, and yet it pops up again and again. So it's a relatively quiet period right now. There's some labor issues, small specific protests around citizenship rights, but nothing major until this past weekend when, um, again, we have you know, Israel violence in Gaza and you know, death of, of, of Palestinians always brings Jordanians to the street. But the government seldom tries to shut those down because it's an issue the government also is in agreement with that this is unacceptable, this kind of violence. So those have brought people out again. Great. That, that actually was going to be my next question, because I, I know that you were recently in Jordan and I was curious to know if, um, you know, if you witnessed any protests, um, if there was a lot of activity, if there were demonstrations that you that you attended or that you heard of um, and who was participating in those protests. But you may have just answered that question. Um, it sounds like it was a pretty quiet period. It was a fairly quiet period. I was also there running a conference. So I was in a hotel running a conference for several days. But did have some time afterwards to spend several days and talk to a lot of people. And for the most part, it's been quiet. The government has very aggressively shut down the Teachers uh, Association, which emerged in the uprisings. It was allowed to form finally. Um, and so that's dampered things. There's a lot of people in prison. There's a lot of people that have just gone through or come out of trials 
for their activism. And so it's a relatively quiet period, but you're still seeing, you know, smaller focused labor issues, the citizen rights issues, things that aren't as threatening to the regime per se are more allowed to happen, like really policy specific issues um, emerge again. That's that's great. That's interesting. Um, and I know in your book, you don't cover um, sort of digital protest and speech. Um, but as I noted in, in our introduction, um, that is a space that also seems to be sort of in parallel um, shrinking and um, and and speech is being um, censored. And um, there's a lot of self censorship as well as a result of that. Yeah, I do have a, a, a couple pages on the cyber crimes law, which is used to silence often activists that are, you know, real time in person activists who might post something online and they'll use that as the excuse to go after them. Uh, so that is happening. But my focus had been at the actual on the ground protest. And so I needed to discuss it, but I haven't done adequate focus research in that area. It's certainly a phenomenally huge wide area and I hope someone is able to write a book uh, on the cyber virtual activism mobilization. That's fascinating. Um, let me move on to sort of another little um, you know, major theme of yours in this book. Um, uh, you, you describe the ways in which the state uses protests for its own political agenda um, and competes with protesters to reclaim space uh, used for protests, turning it into symbols of nationalism, as you've sort of alluded to. Um, I think that this is particularly fascinating and not something that you necessarily think about or hear that takes place in other countries, um, the way that the state and the citizen both use protest um, for their own benefit. So I would really love for you to explore that a little bit. Um, how does the regime use protest to boost or strengthen itself and its policies? Great. So yeah, one of the, the reasons that I found Jordan so fascinating is because it's an authoritarian state. I mean, it likes to pretend it's a constitutional monarchy, but we all know that's a fiction. Uh, and yet it has just hundreds of protests a year and very little violence at protests. You don't have squares where there was a mass, where there's a Rabah massacre, massacre, for example. They just don't exist in Jordan. It doesn't mean there's not severe repression and torture and arrest, but it's a different sort of landscape. And so when I look at the protests um, that are permitted, Part of the question is, why does the government allow certain protests to take place in certain spaces as long as they adhere to, adhere to routines? And simultaneously, if these protests aren't really contentious in their routine, why do protesters continue to do them? And so I think it serves two purposes. For protesters, it allows them to remain relevant. It allows them to continue um, protesting so people know where protests would take place if something does happen. They know where to go, where things are likely, there's a history, certain spaces are known as protest spaces. And they also say that they don't wanna cede those spaces entirely. They're afraid if they stop protesting and they start two years later, they're not gonna be allowed to restart. But for the regime's part, if you think about it, if you can get people to only protest, like the Muslim Brotherhood, this is a wonderful disciplining of the Muslim Brotherhood. You get them to have the, their own parade guard so nothing goes wrong and nothing gets damaged. And they can photograph it and publish it in their newspapers in Estabil. And it looks like there's thousands of people there because there are thousands of people there, but they're not contentious. That's fantastic for the regime for a couple reasons. One, the movements are self-policing. They're being careful not to uh, challenge the regime in a provocative way to cross a red line. And that works to reproduce the regime's power. It's like, we're not going to you know, uh, push in that area. So that's one way. And a second way, and this is widely written in the social movement, this isn't as original, but is that protests are a, a form of information for the regime. Whether 20 people turn out, if 20 people or 50 people are turning out a weekly protest uh, against the you know, Israeli embassy and suddenly a thousand people turn out, that's incredibly important information. So it allows them to have the pulse on the pop public you know, information, what's happening, uh, when new protesters turn out versus the known activists, that gives them new information. And so these are ways in which, by not uh, suppressing the protests, they can gather information from it that still works to reproduce their power um, over you know, society and to silence dissent in certain kinds of ways, as long as it, it adheres to routines that are not too threatening. And so it's really kind of more of a cat and mouse because we think of the protesters came out and they didn't accomplish anything. Right? Then why is the regime allowing them to do it? Well, they're not accomplishing anything, but they are accomplishing something because they're the 
you know, a thorn in the side of the regime that they keep coming out over and over on all these issues and nationwide, not only and on that. So it right. really trying to look at it more uh, sort of as a dialectical issue rather than simply periodic burst of protest that's, you know, either crushed or tolerated as a sort of ongoing movement. Right, that's very interesting. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet, and I do wanna like, save some save some time for that as we're running out of time now is this dynamic of east bankers now participating more and more in the protests um you know historically that has not necessarily been the case you know in your book you do a wonderful job of sort of talking about the role of the east bankers initially you know being the the spoilers um and then being co-opted into the regime and and playing this sort of supportive role mostly with, with the current, um, you know, with the monarchy, but also this has changed over the years. And I would just be fascinated to hear a little bit from you about that issue specifically and, and, and what you've seen in terms of East Bank participation and what it looks like and why East Bankers um, who have traditionally depended on the state for its, um, you know, for, for, their, for their livelihood really and, um, and have played a major role in being the support base to the monarchy. Why is that changing? So yeah, this is a lot in the question you just asked, but I can't, can't touch on all and I hope people read the book for all of it, but just to follow a couple of the threads. Yeah, the conventional story is, again, the British and Hashimites came in and with British backed power and a lot of money imposed itself uh, on the region and created a colonial state, which is broadly a true story. But the first acts of resistance, there were profound acts of resistance some of them strategized and joined with the Hashimites quickly against others because you know this wasn't a single community where everybody wasn't warring with each other. There were domestic and regional, not domestic because it wasn't domestic yet, but regional conflicts among different tribal groupings and divides within tribal groupings. The Huaytat in the south during the Great Arab Revolt fought on both sides, right? So we want to sort of reintroduce that nuance, which historians have covered, but it kind of gets forgotten in the story. Like the East Bankers were never one people in unison. So the story then is who sides with the Hashimites early, who ends up raising a lot of ruckus and ends up getting, you know, we say bought off or co-opted, but in fact, they win things as a result of it. And so over the decades, there's a, a, a relationship where people talk about the East Bankers as being the loyal support base, and they are the support base in very many ways, but they're a support base that expects to get things on a regular basis. Not just material goods, not just transactionally jobs, but they also feel like this was our land, you were an outsider who came in, and you need to preserve our interests. There's a moral economy, as well as this transactional economy. Um, tracing that through to the present, you, the fact that you've never had a single unified you know, East Bank community, there's always been dissent from the East Bank community. The 1989 Hebat Nisan protest, anti-austerity protest started in East Bank areas um, and then spread throughout the country. And so some of the largest and frankly, most violent protests, the ones that burn down police stations, the ones that, you know, tear up asphalt and infrastructure and railroads and pipelines, these are coming from East Bank areas where you also have tremendous loyalists. So you have in the East Bank communities, different uh, factions and different sides about whether this regime is to be supported at all cost or whether they're fed up and they want something different and a serious you know, democratic and sometimes even leftist contingent with the, in the East Bank community that want a democracy come hell or high water. So this uh, Palestinian versus East Bank, of course, actually exists, it's true, but it's not a binary, it's more complicated as most stories are. And the protests, especially over the past decade since the uprisings have really brought that into view because you see some of the most contentious anti-regime critical of the King rhetoric is coming from that supposed loyal support base. Yeah, it's a, it's really, it's an incredibly fascinating dynamic um, and one that seems to be evolving um, still. Yes, certainly. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, and again, um, we're here talking about Dr. Jillian Schwedler's um, new book, Protesting Jordan. I've got a copy of it here. I highly recommend it. Um, and you know, thank you so much for your fascinating research and your interest in these is issues and um, taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me as well. It was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you.